very good. Good evening. It's good to see you all here tonight. I think this is going to be one of those evenings that we will, each of us in this room will never, never forget. Um, I just love that this is happening and that Mr. Freedom is with us in this room. Um, I have a couple things to say and I, I make notes so that I wouldn't forget. Um, as many of you might know, um, I wasn't born in the United States. I'm a naturalized citizen. I was raised in South Africa. And in South Africa, I did my bachelor's degree. And then I never, ever thought that graduate school or teaching at the university would be something that I would have the ability to do. But because of the scholarship in South Africa, I was able to come to the United States. And that's why I love to do major scholarship advising. It's one of my reasons for doing this. I came to the United States, and I entered a graduate school. And I couldn't believe how much fun it was, and I couldn't believe all the opportunities that were afforded me. Uh, for master's degrees, doctoral studies, I went to state universities, like Montana State University. And even as an international student, I was able to work my way through school and get an education that would never have been possible for me anywhere else, including in my home country. And then I started teaching at Montana State. I absolutely loved this, and it's a long story. But I don't want to bore you guys with this, but I, I met my husband here um, at Montana State. And then for the first time, I actually thought about, oh, this is home. And I decided that I would like to become an American citizen. And guys, I have to tell you, you have to study for this exam. So I studied for this exam, and then I had to go to Helena to be inter interviewed. And I walked into this room, and it was just grizz diplomas everywhere. And I thought, <laughs> I'm in trouble. And the first question right out of the box was, how many amendments to the Constitution? And I said, 27, and because that's the right answer. And it was, it was you know, kind of uphill from there. But to make a long story short, I became an American citizen. And I've been so, so very proud of this. Even in South Africa, when we, I lived in apartheid South Africa, it was a very dark, dark period of time, if you can imagine that. Even in South Africa, America was always a beacon of democracy and a beacon of hope for me as a young person looking towards the United States. And then when I came here and I understood how many of our Montana men and women are servicemen and women, how many of our young students are going to wars near and far, I became so deeply patriotic and deeply loyal. So this evening is an opportunity for you to learn more about the complexity of this world that we're in, and that we have to, we can't be thinking in binary terms. Always learn more about any situation. In apartheid South Africa, the press, everything, the television, newspapers were controlled by the government. So I have a healthy skepticism of anything that I see on television or read in the news, and I'm particularly suspicious if somebody tells me not to read a book. That makes me want to read the book much, much more. So here in Honours, we will never tell you what to think, but we'll teach you how to think. And that's the same at the university, because if you can think critically and independently, our democracy is safe. I think this is very important. When, when we see such divisions, I often fear that we're creating our own apartheid. And then I think of the motto of the United States, a pluribus unum, out of many, one. So I'm so grateful to be an American citizen. And I'm so very, very grateful for a Jesuit, very generous family that made it possible for us to have a speaker tonight that we have to provide security for. That also says something about the state of world affairs, that for some individuals we have to offer security because what they say, if they speak truth to power, it can make people feel very uncomfortable. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity. This evening what is going to happen is I'll invite Mr. Freedom to the stage and then he will give a 30 minute talk to you guys and then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes of questions and he again in the car driving over here said how excited he was to hear your questions. So I just want to give a little bit of background on Mr. Innes um, Cantor Freedom. And this is a citation that was given to him when he was the winner of the Outstanding Human Rights Activist Award in 2022. Mr. Freedom is a Turkish American human rights activist, an NBA player and Nobel Prize nominee who lost his NBA career for speaking out against human rights violations in China. Raised in Turkey, Mr. Freedom began to call out human rights violations by President Erdogan in the country of his birth. 
The authorities retaliated by banishing him from the country, listing him in Interpol and imprisoning his father. In 2017, Mr. Freedom narrowly escaped various kidnapping attempts arranged by the Turkish government, agents in Indonesia and Romania. He was under 11 arrest warrants and received countless death threats. Seven years after having his Turkish citizenship revoked, Mr. Freedom became an American citizen and changed his last name to Freedom. He took up the cause of oppressed peoples in China, advocating for a boycott of the Beijing Olympics in response to the ongoing genocide being carried out by the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, against Uyghur Muslims, calling Chinese President Xi Jinping a brutal dictator and donning shoes with free Tibet emblazoned on them. After debuting with human rights slogans on his shoes during the season opener, the Boston Celtics games were subsequently banned in China and Turkey. Through countless interviews and with the art on his freedom shoes, he has spoken out for the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and the people from Hong Kong and Taiwan, as well as others facing CCP oppression. He's become a voice for the oppressed in Turkey, China, Russia, Iran, and many more countries worldwide. In February 22, he was traded from the Boston Celtics to the Houston Rockets, who waived him. The NBA is reluctant to sign him for speaking out against China and has continuously tried to silence him. Now we're just going to watch a quick video by Ms. Oh, Mr. Cantor. Please, Jonathan. You changed your name. I did. Well, the, the reason I did it was because I believe that freedom is the most important thing that you can have after air and water and food, you know? And this is the real deal. You legally changed it. I le legally changed it. The reason I wanted to do it because I really wanted to inspire the young generation because I wanted to put that word behind my jersey and just go to every arena and play for all the fans and show all the kids like this is what freedom means. Um, after having this uh, conversation with my high school teammates, um, you know, I started to read and research about what freedom means to human beings. And I was like, it's like one of the most important word for, word for human lives. So that's why I wanted to, you know, legally, you know, I wanted to legally change my name and became Mr. Freedom. You can see it. Thank you. Students, can we welcome Mr. Enos Cantor, Freedom from Montana State. First of all, I want to say this is my first time in Montana, and I have no idea what happens here. I have literally have no idea. I, I, I literally landed, and there was pictures of bears everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, my friends were telling me to just be careful and don't go outside. It's actually freezing outside. But uh, um, after this, I literally have three more states left that I'm done with America. I literally visited everywhere. I was always curious about Montana. Unfortunately, you guys don't have an NBA team, so I just. I didn't come here, you know, we, we, we never go visit it here. Um, uh, well, the, today I actually want to do something special. I would like to talk to you guys about my childhood because the, given what's happening in Middle East right now, I think it's an amazing opportunity for you guys to understand from, hear from someone who's, who literally lived there uh, his whole, almost his whole life. So, you know, grow, growing up in Middle East, especially growing up in Turkey, um, it was very, very difficult, actually. Um, if you are a politician in Turkey or some of the Middle East countries, and if you want to be elected again, you do two things. You attack America, and you attack Israel. Unfortunately, the base is so uneducated, right? They're like, wow, look at our leader. He's standing totally against America. He's standing totally against Israel. That's what for. So that was the case growing up. I literally, it was all over the news, all the time. The newspapers were saying how you know, evil the Americans are, how terrible the Jewish people are, or the, how you know, horrible the Christian people are, right? So I remember, I am nine years old, and I went downstairs to play uh, with my friends. What I have seen that day shocked me so much, and I still remember till this day. So my little friends were not even teenagers. They were burning American flags. They were burning Israeli flags. They were breaking crosses. And I even asked them, like, guys, what are you doing? 
They said, well, that's what we see on TV. You know, they're terrible, they're horrible, they're terrorists, blah, blah, right? They give me a flag and burn it. Give me a flag, they give me a lighter, they said burn it. So for some reason, I was like, in my head, I was like, this is not the right way to do it. I threw the flag down and I ran upstairs to my mom. I was like, mom, you know, the, my friends are telling me to hate America. They're telling me to hate Israel, Jewish people. Christians, what do I do? My mom said, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but do not hate anyone before you leave. So that day, I gave a promise to my mom. I was like, Mom, I promise I'm not going to hate anyone before I leave. So the, the environment that I was growing up in was getting more and more toxic every day because it's the easiest way to brainwash people using religion. Whenever you go out to rallies, you hold a holy book and said, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for the name of God. So if I'm stealing, if I'm corrupt, if I'm a dictator, I'm doing for the name of God, vote for me. So the environment I was growing up in was getting more and more toxic. My dad said, enough is enough. You're going somewhere. I, I even remember asking my dad like that. You literally are sending me to a country where my friends think it's the most evilest country in the world. Are you sure you want me to go there? He said, go and see it yourself. So I remember my plane, I, I got on a flight. My plane is about to land. It was like a 12 hour flight. And I'm so excited, but at the same time I'm so nervous because I just don't know what to expect. Because the last 17 years, all I hear about how evil you guys are. So my plane landed. And I remember my first practice. After the practice, we were chilling in the locker room, and two of my teammates woke up to me. And they tried to have a conversation with me, but I, I just got so nervous, I turned, turned around and left the locker room. And then I remembered the promise. I was like, you know what? I gotta give it a chance. So I, I got back in the locker room, and I was like, what's up? They said, well, we know that you're not from here. It's your first week. If you wanna go get some halal food. If you, if you want us to take you to some, you know, mosques, let us know, we'll take you. And I was like, that was like the first time, the first moment I was like, hmm, that's not what I heard for the last 17 years about you guys. Anyway, I remember um, my first time that I actually had a Jewish friend. And if in Turkey or some of these Middle East middle countries, you say you have a Jewish friend, you might get shot. Literally, uh, because of because of the brainwashing, it's not the religion. That's what I'm trying. To, every time I have a conversation with a crowd or with anyone, it's not the religion. It's the politicians. So I had this friend. I didn't know she was Jewish. If I knew, I probably wouldn't be friends with her in the first place. And then she called me one day. She said, "Well, we would like you to invite you to our ho home for a Shabbat dinner." I was like, what's the Shabbat in it? They said, well, you know, every Friday, come together, it's our holy day, and we break bread together, we pray. And I was like, what are you? They said, she said, I'm Jewish. I ain't got the phone. Um, and then again, I remember that promise to my mom. I called her back, I said, I'm sorry. And I was like, I'm coming. So we hang up the phone, right? And I called one of my Turkish friends who lives in America. I was like, listen, I'm going to one of my friend's house, and she was Jewish, and he was freaking out too. Um, I was like, if you don't hear from me for the next two hours, you better call the police. <laughs> anyway, so I went to her house. I'm so nervous because it's the first time ever that I'm actually getting to you know, talk to someone who's not in my religion. Anyway, we had a, so that night we had an amazing, amazing night. We, they sang together, some of the food that we ate is the same, some of the prayers that they do was really similar and stuff. But when I was going back to my place, I got so emotional because I was like, there are millions of kids in the Middle East growing up anti-Semitic, anti-West, anti-American, anti-Christian just because of these politicians. I was like, we gotta change that. So I called my friend back. I was like, listen, I want to learn about your religion. I want to learn, learn about your culture. Like, give me some, help me understand your religion. Give me some books, tell me some shows, documentaries, give me some movies. She's like, I got you. There is this one movie 
You watch it, you learn everything about Israel. I was like, what is it? He said, don't mess with Saul. <laughs> I'm sure you guys watch this. If you don't, please watch it. It's one of the most funniest movies ever. So, anyway, so and then after that, um, it was an eye opener for me. Um, I got drafted, I went to the University of Kentucky, then I got drafted by Utah Chess. You know, going to Utah was very interesting because it was one of the most holiest places I've actually ever been to. Uh, Mormons, amazing people. They knocked my door many times. And we had a lot of beautiful conversations to, together. You know, I was like, listen, I'm not going to convert, but come and tell me about your religion. I would like to learn so I can have a better conversation with the fans, with some of the people out there. You know, they were really nice, wearing really nice clothes, and coming there very gentle and everything. So we had a really good uh, conversation and stuff. But that helped me a lot. There was many times when my teammates were going out, hanging out, partying and stuff. I was going back to my hotel. I was just, you know, reading Book of Mormon, reading Bible, or reading Torah, because I wanted to learn so I can have a better conversation with my teammates or with the people that I have actually talked to. Anyway, so, um, in high school, I remember, before the NBA in high school, there was this moment. Uh, after the practice, everybody was just hanging out in their, lo uh, in their locker room, right? We were just, everybody was on their phone, and I saw one of my teammates post on Facebook, and he was criticizing the president. I immediately turned around, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He said, what happened? I was like, well, I just saw your post. He said, I, he said, okay. I was like, well, you might be in jail tomorrow. He said, what are you talking about? Because my whole life, if you say a word about the government, the next day you'll be in jail. You know what's so crazy? I'll give you guys an example. So I have this manager, his name is Hank, and his wife is Turkish. So during the All-Star, right, before the All-Star, if you are a fan, you put like, Say NBA, hashtag NBA star, just say like LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or Kevin Durant, and that's like one vote for your favorite player. So obviously, all the Turkish people were voting for me, but so his dad voted for me, right? And just because of he put my name on his Twitter, he was in jail for 13 days. Think about it. Anyway, so I grew up in a country like that. I'm gonna uh, get uh, more to it, but. Um, so after that, all my teammates turned around and started to laugh. And I was like, why are you guys laughing? So it was the first time I actually got introduced to freedom. They were trying to explain, explain to me about what freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of protest, just because of you don't like the government, just because of you post something about the regime, whatever, you won't go in jail. So they were just trying to explain to me for the first time ever. I felt like they were talking to a different language, I promise you. Um, you know, and then, and then after that I got drafted, obviously, you know, I have you know, learned more from my teammates and stuff. But uh, back in 2013, uh, there was this big corruption scandal happened in Turkey. And President Erdogan and his, some of his family members were involved in it. And that was the first time I said something about it. It was my third year in the league. My first two years, all I cared about was just going out, hanging out with my teammates, just trying to win some games, you know? My third year, when the corruption scandal happened, President Erdogan was going around and putting innocent people in jail because a lot of the media outlets and journalists were talking about it. So he was shutting down media outlets, he was uh, putting innocent people in jail, and uh, as an NBA player, I didn't know nothing about it, but I was like, if you're fighting against a free media, I'm gonna say something about it. So I put a tweet out there. Because of the NBA platform, it became a conversation in the United States and, and uh, Turkey. So I was like, even one simple tweet can affect this much from now on. I'm gonna start paying attention about what's going on in my country more and more. So I started to study. I started to you know, write op-eds about it, do interviews about it. And every time I say something, it was becoming a conversation because of the NBA platform, and they really hated that. Um, what they did to silence me was actually very disgusting. You know, first, my dad was one of the biggest scientists in Turkey, boom, they fired him. Second, you know, my sister went to medical school for six years, she still cannot find a job. 
I think the saddest one was my little brother because he was getting kicked out of every team and he wanted to be like his big brother, play in NBA and represent his country. But because of the same last name, he was getting kicked out. So they were getting affected so much, they had to put a statement out there and said, we are disowning Ennis. The letter actually is still out there on the internet. So after that, Turkish government didn't believe that. They sent police to my house in Turkey and they raided the whole house and they took every electronics away. Phones, computers, laptops, because they wanted to see if I am still in contact with my family or not. Couldn't find no evidence, but they still took my dad in jail for a while. But we put so much pressure from here to Turkey, they had to let him go. And then after that, you know, they put my name on Interpol list. I have now 12 arrest warning for me. And, and um, you know, they tried to kidnap me many times and just, just recently. So I was in Vatican. I had an amazing meeting with the Pope. I don't know if you guys seen the pictures or not. It was everywhere. So we actually organized the first basketball camp in the Vatican. Um, the next day, they put a bounty on my head. FBI called me, right? They said, we need you to get back to America immediately because this can be really dangerous. You're not in America, and this could literally trigger mafias and killers and so, some of the other people, whatever. Um, so, and after that, boom, I, the next day I came back to uh, America, and since then I maybe left a few times, you know? Um, it's, it was very difficult for me to just not be able to see or talk to my family for the last 10 years. The only thing was, you know, was my escape was basketball. Because every time I was out there with my teammates, my coaches, it was all about them, you know? And, and then just two years ago, uh, during, um, was two and a half years ago, sorry. I'm doing a basketball camp in New York. And after the basketball camp, all the kids just lined up front of me, right? So there was this one kid I took a picture with, and his parent literally called me out front of everybody and said, how can you call yourself a human rights activist when your Muslim brothers and sisters are getting tortured and raped every day in concentration camps in China? And I was like, whoa. I turned around, and I was like, I promise I'm going to get back to you. So I... That day I canceled everything, I went back, uh, back to my hotel, I started to study about what's going on. And obviously on the internet you can't find all kind of news, you don't know which one to trust or So I called my manager, I was like, I need you to find me a concentration camp survivor. He found me one, it was a lady, so we sit down, we had this one hour conversation. She was telling me about all the torture methods and gang raping, she was telling me about uh, for sterilization and abortion, and organ harvesting, and actually how many people are dying in there and stuff daily, right? At the end of our conversation, I asked her, what, I, what can I do to help? She said, nothing. I was like, what do you mean nothing? We just had this one-hour conversation for no reason. She said, no, I live in America. I live an amazing life here. Help those two or three million people are getting tortured and raped every day. So at that moment, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever it takes to help these people because no one talking about it. Um, I wanted to do it in a very unique way. So I could have just gone on the internet, media, interview, tweet, whatever. But whenever I watched an NBA game, when I was a little kid, the first thing I was watching was the shoes. What, sh what kind of shoes they're wearing, what color, if they're comfortable. And the next day I was telling my dad, please buy those shoes for me. You know, everyone here I'm sure loves shoes. So I was like, you know what, let's come, I came up with this idea, let's reach out, reach out to these artists around the world, and let's ask them to put all the struggles, whatever those people going through on the shoes, and we're just going to go out there and play basketball. There was no rule against it, because three years ago, when NBA took us to the NBA ball, I was there, and all those players were putting on their shoes, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Revolution, George Floyd, which I'm not against because that is your freedom of protest and you can do it in America. But if, if the rule, if you can do it, I can do it too. Anyway, so my first topic was free Tibet. I don't know if you guys know what's happening in Tibet. I don't know if you guys follow Dalai Lama or what's happening. Or it's pretty much like a cultural genocide. So I put the shoes on. I went out, I don't know if you guys can see from here, uh, it was this one right there. So I put the shoes on, I went out there, right? 
I was playing for the Celtics. My first game was at, Ma at Madison Square Garden, opening night, our biggest rivalry, right? They just had like Julius Randle, they have like a couple of the good players now. So it's like, it's gonna be like the hottest game. It's on ESPN, nationally te televised. I was like, this is the best game to do it. So I put the shoes on, I'm st I started to uh, warm up. One minute before the game, we are in a team huddle. The game is up now. We literally have less than one minute left of the game start. So one minute before the game, two gentlemen from the NBA, they were working for the Celtics, came up to me and said, take your shoes off. I was like, excuse me? Is that your shoes has been getting so much attention internationally, he was from China. They said, you gotta take them off. Um, for me, it was a perfect moment because I was just getting ready for my citizenship test. So I was like, I closed my eyes. I was like, okay, there are 27 amendments. My first amendment, freedom of speech, <laughs> no. They're like, what do you mean no? They said, well, you know, I, I'm not breaking any rules. I was like, go tell your boss, Adam Silver, go tell your boss, even if I get fined, I'm not taking them off. They said, we're not talking about a fine, we're talking about getting banned. Think about it, they were literally threatening me to get banned by the NBA because of the shoes. Anyway, so first half, we, I played zero minutes. I went in the locker room. I had thousands of notifications in my phone. I clicked on the one that my manager sent me. He said, every Celtics game is banned in China. Think about it. It took him 24 minutes to ban one of the most, well, it was Lakers and Celtics, one of the most famous and most success, successful team in NBA rest of the year. Boom, bam. And I was like, well, that clearly helps, helps my case. That pretty much shows like the dictatorship and the censorship. Anyway, so game ended. I played zero minutes, which I played every game before that. We lost the game, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so after the game, there was this huge media storm. We were literally getting requests from like, even like from Indonesia, from Vietnam, like every media outlet wanted to hear what I have to say, why did I do that? I was like, I told my manager, decline everything, because I did not want my teammate to think that I'm doing it for attention. So after the uh, game, the NBPA called me, the Player Association, which I give thousands of dollars every year to protect my rights against the NBA. They said, you know what you did? You can never wear those shoes ever again. I was like, am I breaking any rules? They said, no. But we, they said, we're gonna lose millions of dollars. Do not wear that number again. So they pressured me so much. I was like, you know what? I promise I'm not gonna wear free to bad shoes ever again. Is that promise? I said, promise, we didn't get that one. <laughs> Next game, I wore free Uyghur shoes. <laughs> right, they called me after the game. They said, you're a liar, you lied to us. I was like, I never lied to you. I never said I'm not gonna wear free Uyghur shoes. I just said, I'm just not gonna wear free to bad shoes. At that moment, they understand that they're not gonna be able to make me apologize or take my tweet down and say sorry or I wasn't educated enough. So the third game was our biggest game of the year because it was against Charlotte, at Charlotte, and who owns Charlotte? Michael Jordan. So who was face off Nike? Michael Jordan. So I was like, this is the best game ever for me. So the third game, we wore, you know, modern day slavery shoes. And these are obviously, you guys know shoes, these are Michael's, Michael Jordan's shoes. You know, so I was like, you know what, let's come up with a design, let's put this, you know, modern day slavery, he put right Nike, and let me see what else, and no more excuses and all that stuff, on the shoes, and we're just gonna go out there, play basketball, in front of Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> oh God, you guys should have seen my teammates' face when I take them out, of, take those shoes out of my bag. I took them out, they said, dude, you wore the shoes, it's over, you don't go, you don't go at the go GOAT. Because you go at the GOAT, it's over. You're gonna be out of the media. I was like, you know what? Whatever. So I put the shoes on. I went out there, start uh, playing and stuff. And obviously, no one really cared about the game. The whole media, everybody was, was focusing on the shoes, you know? And, uh, and after the game, uh, many of my teammates actually woke up to me and said, this is it. This is your last year. Have fun, smile, I hope we win a championship, but you're never gonna get another contract after this. Um, and after the shoes, my agent called me, and he's like, listen, dude, I work for you, I don't work for the NBA, so I gotta be honest with you. 
You're 30 years old, 29, 30 years old, you could play another like six, seven years with endorsement deals and everything. That's like, that's like close to $60 million. <coughs> and just make sure you say goodbye to that. I said, okay. And he got the phone, never talked to him ever again. Fire. You know? Um, it was the perfect moment because I, it was right before the Beijing Olympics. So forget about the NBA. I literally try to reach out to so many other athletes. And I try to reach out to NFL, MLB, NHL, uh, MLS. I even try to reach out to Olympians. I was like, dude, do not become part of the propaganda. You know, join me. We'll create a moment, and we'll just talk about. We'll just talk about this. Uh, it's not a political; it's a humorized issue. Um, they said, you know, we love you. I think what you're doing is so inspirational, but we cannot support you out loud. I was like, why? They said, well, we have shoe deals, endorsement deals. We want to get another contract. I asked them one simple question. I was like, put yourself in their shoes. If your mother, if your sister, or if your daughter was in those concentration camps getting tortured and raped every day, would you still take money and business over your morals, values, and principles? They usually turn around and leave the room. Um, February came. You know, and everybody knew that this, I played against Brooklyn Nets. We literally destroyed them. Um, <laughs> it was KD, Kyrie, and everybody. It was, an, it was amazing. Anyway, um, coach, for some reason, put me in the last quarter, and, and I got like eight points and 12 rebounds in 12 minutes. And everybody knew that was my last game. Like the whole bench and coaching staff, and, and NBA was, that was my last game. Because the next day was a trade deadline, and everybody knew that I was going to get traded and be released and never play basketball again. So I played the game, right? And I don't, I don't know if you guys watch basketball or not, but I don't really shoot threes. So there was just a lot, it was like a game, it was like a, we, 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 we are beating them by like 30 points. And then it was like 10 seconds left on the clock, they gave me the ball. I was like, I took a step back, I was like, I shoot the three, I was like, it's my last game anyway, who's going to say anything? So I made it, and it was my last point. Next day, the next day, right, trade deadline happened. I got traded to Houston Rockets. And Houston Rockets is a Chinese, pretty much like China's team because of Yao Ming, because of Daryl Morey. I don't know how much you guys follow Daryl Morey's stuff and whatever. He was the first guy that came out and said he's time with Hong Kong, and they released me. <sighs> so, right after that, um, I did not care about, I was getting support from so many different people. Literally, we, I had a conversation with Dalai Lama, I had a conversation with the Pope, I had a conversation with the Prime Ministers and Presidents and the White House, so many people. I literally didn't care about any of it. I wanted one of my teammates to just text me and say, hey, we support you, good luck. I played 11 years in NBA, 11 years. I had hundreds of teammates, Hundreds of coaches, so many people from the foreign offices, not one of them texted me. Not one of them texted me and say, hey, good luck with whatever comes your way next. Not one. Um, that sh literally shattered my heart because they were literally like my brother. When I couldn't see my family for the last 10 years, they were there for me. Um, they supported me when they arrested me, when or try to kidnap me, literally like Russell Westbrook or Steven Adams and all the other like players were the first one to text me and say, I'm doing okay, you know? But when this whole thing happened, I saw that they were just so scared and they started to follow me on social media, which I understand because they had a Nike deal and all that stuff. Well, like, dude, I don't care about the social media, just text me, you'll have my number, you, have my, uh, uh, you can call me, right? Anyway, so I think that was the one thing that really broke my heart, but, you know, I, definitely the, the freedom was going to come with consequences, and when you stand up for some of the things that are happening in the world, um, you know, it's not going to be free, for sure. Um, people keep losing about me, losing my career, whatever, I really didn't care about it. I, if I had to do it all over again, I would pick that over playing basketball a million times. What I really cared about was just not being able to see my family for the last 10 years. Um, so every night, I used to pray. You know, I was like, God, please let me see my family one last time. That was my only wish in the world. 
literally only rich. I did not care about the millions or didn't care about the endorsement deals or basketball beer. All I care about was the family. And uh, I was just too thinking, I was like, why God hasn't answered my prayers yet? Because the last 10 years, every night I was just praying, I was like, God, please Ed, let me see my family one last time. But then I started to go to events, right? I started to talk to the crowds. I started to talk to the so organizing basketball camp for kids and stuff. Um, then I seen, they used to ask me like, well, who's your favorite player? Who's the GOAT? Who's the this and that? And now, these little kids are asking me about what's happening in Tibet, what's happening in Taiwan. Tell us about Ukraine and Russia come. Tell us about what's happening with Palestine and Israel and stuff. And I was like, these are like seven, eight, nine year old kids. And I was like, you know what? That is like the biggest, I guess, family that I could ever ask for. So God has answered my prayers. Whenever I see, I see thousands of, of brothers and sisters are waiting to be inspired. You know, so I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, but I just wanted to tell you guys because every day I'm sure you guys are waking up and seeing the conflict that are happening in the Middle East, what's happening with Israel and Palestine, Turkey is not involved in it, Yemen is not involved in it, but I wanted to give you guys what's really happening over there. It's not the religion, it's definitely not the people, it's the politicians. They're the one making the decision, but the innocent kids and innocent people are part of the street that was getting bombed, you know? So it, it does break my heart. So that, yeah, that is my speech. And if you guys have any questions, please, you guys can ask me anything you want. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor for questions for my students. Okay, I really want to get to see what they have to ask. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Dennis, I'm a big Celtics fan, and when I thought of, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, <laughs> when I think of Dennis Freedom, I think of the bubble, and I was curious, when they reached out to you with the idea of staying in one place for that amount of time, oh, God. What, was, what was your reaction to that? Because Obviously, with you, it was a really unique situation, but I can't imagine staying in one place for that long. Yeah, so first of all, I'm really thankful for it because a lot of players were complaining about it. And I mean, we were literally living in a five-star hotel and everything. The breakfast, lunch, dinner was there. We, we, we were doing something that we love and it was televised everywhere and stuff. I mean, actually, one of the players, Steven Adams, came out and said, dude, this is not Syria. You should be happy you play basketball in Disney, you know? But same time, it was so challenging mentally. We literally had to, I had to stay in the same room for 82 days and the rules were so strict. We had to get tested twice a day. Um, and on top of that, I remember, was, I think it was someone from Sacramento. Be before, like, I think that like the first week of the bubble, he ordered something from Uber Eats. And he literally left the hotel crossed the street, took his food, came back. They put him in his room for seven days. He wasn't allowed to leave his room for seven days. Think about it, you know? And the room is not like the best room. It was just like, it was like a very small room. Anyway, so it was really tough uh, mentally. And also like, we couldn't really see, well, I, I don't have a family here, but for all my teammates, you know, some of them have like a, like newborn babies, some of them have kids and wives and all that stuff. So it was really hard on them too. And uh, when, after the 60th day, they open up the doors and say, you know, families can come in, but they had to quarantine for, I believe, 10 days in a room first. So think about all the kids and a mom had to stay in a room for 10 days to, you know, be in a bubble. So it was, it was very challenging, very uh, difficult. And I'm just really sad. It really sucks that Lakers won it because I really hate the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> I have, two, I have two questions for you. Yes, go ahead. I am not a Celtics fan. Good. No, I'm just kidding. Um, two, two questions. Do you have any regret in hindsight for your activism? And can you make a comment about the anti Semitism uh, that we're seeing right now on right. the college campus? Uh, I, I definitely have no regrets because 
while I was, or we were, you know, playing comfortably in America and making millions of dollars, living the best lifestyle, um, eating the best food, staying in a five-star hotels and be on the best cars or houses, whatever, on the other side of the world, people are losing their loved ones, losing their lives and losing their homes, you know? We have to have some empathy and sympathy. That's what we don't really usually do. When you put yourself in their shoes, you know, and it will, it should hurt. It should definitely hurt. So no, I have zero regrets because someone had to came out and talk about this because I was seeing the hypocrisy, especially with the NBA. NBA came out during the bubble. It was not about basketball. It was literally about social justice. And NBA and Adam Silver was the one who were pushing us to say, you know, talk about Black Lives Matter. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not against it. Talk about Black Lives Matter, talk about the problems that happened in America, talk about the, you know, this and that. But then, way worse, whatever happening, thousand times worse happening in China, literally is a genocide. Think about it. And you see no athletes, no actors are saying a word about it. Um, the more I, you know, we keep talking about how free we are in this country. We're really not free. The reason is, the more I research, the more I realize, I'll ask you guys a question. How can the biggest dictatorship in the world, like China, right, can control organizations like NBA, Hollywood, Wall Street, academias, big tech, Congress, local Congresses? It's all about the money. People were keep complaining about the spy balloon on the air, but we literally have 150 million balloons on our phone, TikTok, you know? When I, I mean, it's a serious, I wish, I, I don't know, if, I'm sure you, some of you guys have TikTok on your phone, but everything you guys told and whatever is being watched by the Chinese government. Um, so the threat is real. I actually had a conversation, this is a very interesting conversation, I wanna uh, tell you guys, I got a permission from them so I can uh, tell you guys about it, but, when I started to talk about the problems that were happening in uh, China, I sat down with some people in the, from the government, and they were, because they were, they really wanted to make sure that I'm okay and they won't get me in any way possible. So we had a briefing about what can they do to actually get me. So I was talking about China, back then, you know, Russia, Turkey, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, and Cuba. So they literally briefed me about which country can get me in what way. Uh, they said, first, we would like to start talking about China. So you said a word about China for the next year or two, going forward now, you will be getting text messages, WhatsApps, calls, DMs, whatever, from one of the most beautiful girls in the world. Do not answer them, the Chinese spies. Do you know how bad that they, they will just mentally mess you up? <laughs> I get so much DMs now on my Instagram. I have to decline them all because I don't know if they actually want me or they're out there to get me, you know? So I get like, oh my God, especially, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it much, but like, NBA plays against a lot of crazy DMs. <laughs> yeah, so I have to like decline them all. The client, the client, because I don't know if they're like there to get me. So they were just telling me about how can they get you. Like they were talking about like the little cameras that they put on their like um, button, whatever, and then all your business is out there. And then they will they will use it against you. They said, well, if you don't apologize, if you don't say China is the best country in the world, they're gonna release these videos. It was that crazy. They told me about Russia. They said, well, they, not in America, but outside of America, when you go to a restaurant, do not go to a game because they can poison you. They said, Iran, they don't play any games, they will just come and shoot you. <laughs> they said, North Korea, they, they will just uh, hack you. I'm sure that there's a movie called The Interview, I'm sure you guys watched it. It's one of the funniest movies. After that movie, North Korea actually hacked Sony for $1 billion. Yeah. So they were just briefing me about one by one, but no, I have no regrets. So you asked me about anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, given what's happening in the Middle East right now, what breaks my heart the most is uh, every city, every state, country, or con continent, whatever, have Muslim and Jewish, you know, communities now hate each other, you know? Um, they, the governments are the ones that, whatever, that's fighting, but the people on the streets, 
you know, that are just going pro. If I, as a Muslim, if I go for a kosher butcher and open up a Palestinian flag and say free Palestine, that is not going to end the war, you know? We need to come up with solutions that, you know, that is going to end the war. It's the mindset. So it, just, it breaks my heart to see what's happening over there. Now you see in New York, there are protests everywhere. Now you see the schools and universities. You know, kids can't even go out there and walk freely because they're scared. If you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, you don't know what kind of like, you know, challenges or what kind of treatment you're going to face. You know, so it is definitely on the rise of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and we gotta do something about it. You know, so. So my question is, for somebody who's in your position who's a celebrity athlete and has that really big public platform, do you believe somebody like that has an obligation to advocate for human rights issues because of that publicity? I feel like especially if you're an athlete, you know, many people say, well, you know, the athlete should get into politics. I don't do politics. I do human rights. There's a huge difference between human rights and politics. I have never in my life went out there. Even with Turkey, even with my country, who is literally holding my family as hostage, I don't even talk about politics. Because once you talk about politics, especially in America, you lose 50% of the people. But if you talk about human rights and political prisoners and you know, basic rights, I don't care if you're from the right, from the left, whoever you vote for, whoever you cheer for, you have to care about human rights because it's about politics. So yes, I feel like as a someone who has a platform, especially if you're an athlete, there are millions of kids out there watching you, idolizing you now with the apps and social media and stuff. They want to see what you're doing. So you can go out there and put the craziest things out there. Like someone is, I don't want to give any names, I don't want to bleach report tomorrow, but like some of those football players, NFL players out there, whatever. But at the same time, you can go out there and put like, you know, the most beautiful things about peace, about love, about building bridges and stuff, you know? So yes, for sure. I mean, we, don't need the mic we don't even need the microphone, I'll just, I can just hear you guys. Alright, um, can I put you on the spot a little bit? If you could send one text message to everybody in the world, what would it say? Oh, that's good. Ooh. That's a good question. To anyone? Everybody. Whole world gets it. Um, wow, that's a really good question. You can, you can cycle just, back, you can take time. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I think that there's this one quote that I always go by, live for others, you know? Because once we stop thinking about, you know, our egos and ourselves and start thinking about others and have some empathy and sympathy, that's where, where, where we're going to have the real change. You know, there's the, there was a really good quote, it says, um, when the love of power, do you guys know this quote? Anyway, I'm not, I'll forget about it. I can tell you guys later. But I think the one quote I will say is live for others. And I think it's the most beautiful short quote that I've ever heard about. It. Yeah. You're talking about these like uh, forces of capitalism and freedom uh, that interact, especially in places with high platforms like the NBA. Uh, do you think there's a realignment of these that needs to happen uh, within influential figures? Uh, is there some sort of change you would like? within like these NBA deals, for instance? So think about, I want to give you guys a couple of examples. Think about the relationship, you just said NBA, right? Think about the relationship between NBA and China. It's $5 billion. And NBA's biggest sponsor is Nike, you know? Um, so we just put, actually, I was just talking about it with a couple of my friends. We just put a bill out there in DC. If you're a company, which there are 82 of them right now in America, use a slave labor. If you're a company, and if you have any involvement, involvement with the slave labor, you're not allowed to step into America. We put this bill out there, it's called Uyghur Force Prevention Act, you guys can go out there and check it out. 82 companies are using it, unfortunately. And to make a shoe, to make a Nike shoes, right, it's like three, four, whatever hundred dollars in America. But to make it in China, it's like two or three dollars. So obviously all the companies are going to China, and use a slave labor. There are kids between age of like the six and to 16, working 16 hours a day and six times a week, are making the shoes, you know? So we put this bill out there. When we put this bill out there, companies like Nike and Apple and I think a couple other ones were literally sat in their biggest lobbying groups and spending millions of dollars 
to fight against this bill. But it passed Congress, it passed Senate, and President Biden signed it. And I think I'm hearing from my Uyghur friends already, some of these companies started to move out that Xinjiang area to, to countries like Vietnam, Indonesia. That is going to cost some companies billions of dollars. And figures like, say LeBron James, Jordan, um, say other, like, I'm giving an example from the NBA, but there are thousands of them, you know? They can put so much pressure on these companies and our organizations. If LeBron came out and said, you know what, you know, I care about the things that are happening in America, at the same time, the, the shoes that I've been wearing is made by slave kids. So I want Nike to stop using slave labor. I promise you, it will have so much effect. You guys have no idea because he is the face of Nike. He's the face of them today, you know? So what I wanted to do, but unfortunately the contracts and shoe deals and whatever, they're just too scared to do it. Um, they put a lot of pressure, that say, say, I mean, can give you an example of LeBron, but there are many other ones, but they're signing these hundreds of millions of, do uh, mi millions of dollars, these contracts, and unfortunately, you know, once you talk about it, you're out. They're gonna do everything they can to end your career. So. Yes, go ahead. So what can somebody who doesn't really have a platform, just your average, ordinary, day-to-day -day person, do as small acts of protest as we go about our own lives? So a lot of people are actually asking this question, oh, I'm not going to be a player, I don't have millions of followers, what can I do in a city or a state like Montana, you know? Um, it's actually very simple. If you're going to go out there and buy something, you pick it up, it says made in China, put it down. Literally, that's it. Don't download TikTok on your phone. That's, that's an, another thing that you can do. Or just encourage your classmates, teammates, whoever that runs you. Because they literally brainwashing our generation with TikTok. If I could tell you, like me, well, whenever I'm in DC, I have a lot of conversation with some of the senators and congressmen about, the, about the, the danger of TikTok. It's literally brainwashing the whole America and it's literally a spy balloon on your phone. It was just so crazy, it was just, I was literally laughing. Everybody was talking about the spy balloon on the air, but we literally have a spy balloons, 150 million of them on our phone, and no one talk, talks about it, you know? Um, we are trying to get that app banned in America, but it's just so, they're just so strong, and they've been growing like since the COVID years, you know? So it's literally that simple. Ahead, buddy. Do you have any advice? So when you're talking about athletes and teams, like being scared to act up because of these incentives, and you obviously face that fear. Do you have any advice, like as people, as leaders, like how to embrace that fear and do those hard things? I mean, this is literally God's work. You know, if you if you have, I'm sure they they have faith. You know, if you believe in God, this is literally God's work. You know, to just to be, to be the voice of all those innocent people out there who don't have a voice, help others, and trying to be, you know, just trying to help your neighbor or whatever. I'm sure in the Bible, there are a lot of quotes or there are a lot of verses about your neighbor and your friends and helping the others and whatever. So this is literally God's work. So they're literally picking money over God's work. And all I want to say, I'm not telling them to take the gun and go fight in the wars. I'm literally saying just speak the truth and stand up for innocent people. Be the voice of those kids who are getting bombed, who are getting killed every day. But obviously these organizations and uh, Hollywood, I'm sure you guys heard about Richard Gere. I'm sure you guys know his actors. I don't know if you guys don't, he was a really big actor a, a long time ago and he stand up for the Tibetans and that was it. And he never played in a movie ever again, just because of that. You know, Hollywood every year, wants to get into that, say hundreds of movies are being made in Hollywood. Only say five or 10 of them it can go into that Chinese market. And once you go into that market, it's over. You know, you made, you'll make billions of dollars maybe. And every movie um, is made for to get into that market. So it just, it just crazy to me. Yes. Um, so home for a lot of people can be uh or a place and as somebody who's moved a lot and like hasn't seen their family for many years, what is home to you? 
Good question. Uh, what is home to me? Um, I wish I could say Turkey, but it's not. I mean, they really put me in a most wanted terrorist list. Um, you know, when I become an American, when I became an American citizen, um, I wanted to give actual credit to my teammates because they are the one actually prepared me for this test. So there is hundred questions, right? And they were asking me these questions before the games, after the games, before the practice. So they were just keep quizzing me. And once I become a citizen, they actually throw this like big party in the locker room. They actually made me cupcakes. Graham Williams, I'm sure you guys know who that is. Graham Williams actually made me cupcakes and he put like uh, blue and red uh, sprinkles on it. I was like, thank you, I appreciate that. But I wish I could show them that how amazing this country is. And obviously I'm not saying this country is perfect. We've got a lot of things to work on it. I remember one time we were sitting down in the locker room uh, it was with the Celtics, and everybody was saying, oh my God, America is so bad, so trash, so horrible. We can't believe we just, you know, we live here. I stopped them for a second. I was like, listen, the season is about to be over. And whenever the season over, I'm going to buy you a first class ticket. Don't worry, it's a first class ticket. Mm -hmm. And let's go to some of these countries out there. Let's go to Iran. Let's go to Russia. Let's go to China. Let's go to North Korea. Let's go to Venezuela, Cuba, Turkey and you guys will see what a real dictatorship looks like. Forget about calling them trash. If you even criticize those countries, you and your family members will be jailed and tortured to death. So I think what's for the last you know, two or three years that this country opened their arm and gave me a warm welcome. So I would probably say um, America is now home. Yeah? Let's do one more question. Sure, there's a couple more. <laughs> So I've read a lot about people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag Archipelago who left Russia during the Soviet Union and came to America. And he found that his experiences were often dismissed by the intelligentsia. And he had a quote from criticizing America and uh, celebrating communism. So why do you think it is that people's experiences like yours even are dismissed so easily for criticizing you know, other issues? So if you're a dictator, say, say, for example, like Turkey. Right? Uh, they brainwash you so much because every media outlet, every journalist, every Twitter account is controlled by the government. So you are thinking that, oh my God, you live in a heaven. You know? Whatever the, the government is doing, he's doing right. So let's vote for it. He's a strong man, he's Muslim, he's standing against America, America is evil, and Israel is terrible, Christian people are horrible, you know, he's standing tall, he's the only one who's standing tall against them. So, they've been brainwashed, you know? But whenever you actually start to travel, start to go around and see countries like whatever, America, or some of these like European countries, you're like, huh, that's not what I have seen or heard or witnessed for the last six whatever years, you know? Um, it was a little hard for me to get that poison out of my body. I literally came to America for the first time as I was staying with an American family. They were the one that was teaching me everything. I was literally hating on Americans, Christians, and Jewish people, America, everybody, because I just didn't know enough. I came, I remember I was staying at this, you know, host family. They had this, like, American flag in front of their house. I was like, why do you guys have a flag in front of your house? Are you guys using this also as in, like, an embassy or something? They said, no, we love our country. I was like, okay, but why do you have the flag? I was like, to show people that we love our country. You know, I was just very like confused. Why do they have, even have a flag, you know? So for me, it was, it was very interesting. It took me at least four or five years to get that poison out of my body. But once you're out, you want to inspire other and stuff. But these countries like Russia, Turkey, or some of these other you know, countries, that's all you know because you've been brainwashed by the government. I'm just wondering, um, what are your goals for the next few years in your life? Um, how are you going to keep inspiring people? Um, so, when I got released by the NBA, uh, I went to DC to talk to this, some of those lawmakers about like, what, sh what should we do? Because um, the, we, we are actually still talking about it, we were just keep talking about hearing. 
where we're going to invite Adam Silver, the CEO of Nike, we're going to invite the Player Association to testify before the Congress. Now, I'm sure you guys watched it before and they were just going to ask them like, all these questions. And so we were just talking about it and they said, well, what would you like to do next? Um, at one point, I was like, what about politics? You know, what about just go to a state and run for a Congress or Senate? They said, they all said, absolutely not. I was like, why? They said, well, because your message is the only message that is going to bring two sides together. Because like I said again, whichever party, whatever you're from, you have to care about human rights. So they said, keep doing what you're doing. Go out there, try to give you know, speeches, inspire people, organize basketball camps and all that stuff. But once that America is, you know, four or five years ago, America wasn't just uh, divided. For the last four, three, four years, America is becoming, you know, is very divided. It breaks my heart, actually. It really breaks my heart because we only have one country, so we, we need to figure out what can we do to make this country better. But every day I see this side is attacking this side, other side is attacking the, hating the other side and stuff. We only have one country, you know? So my goal right now is just to just keep doing what I'm doing. Organize basketball camps around the world and just hang out with you guys, go to different states, give talks and stuff. But once, once the time comes, I will, I think, run for an office. That's a wonderful way to, I, I think, do you want to do one more question? Sure, let's do one more question, oh, buddy. With the mustache, I used to have a mustache. <laughs> Oh, you're gonna get me in trouble. Do <laughs> well, I have any advice on? Uh, do I have any advice on uh, something? Okay. Well, I mean, everything you guys watch on, I guess, mainstream media, you know, is being controlled by one side. So you, I don't know where you guys can get like the fresh air, but you go on one side, they have their agenda. You go to the other side, they have their own agenda. You got a newspaper, you read it. You have one agenda. You read the other side, they have their own agenda. So that will, that's what breaks my heart. So I'm just like, instead of talking what's right, they just keep attacking each other. And look at our country right now. You ask many countries around the world, they don't respect America like they used to anymore. You know? Because there are sh school shootings every week. There are, you know, all these crazy things that are happening here. But um, I will just say, to get the right source, I guess don't watch TV a lot. Don't go on. The, you know, the Twitter lot because everything is controlled by someone. So I don't know where you're going to get your fresh air, but everything, every channel, newspaper, media outlet is controlled by someone, you know, and they're just putting their own agenda on. So. But Stephen Davis was a basketball player for our Bobcats. So we have two basketball Good. players. I'm normally quite tall. <laughs> yeah, not today. But Stephen, would you please thank yeah, Mr. Brother? Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the MSU faculty, staff, and students. The blanket? Of Russell Francis. I want to give you a blanket. Oh, it's a blanket. How cold it was. Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> Oh wow, that's amazing actually. This discussion. I know we'll have more time over dinner, but I want to honor the gift of your your story. I appreciate that. Your no, thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. No, I, so Stephen is a member of two tribes. This is a beautiful tradition. And Enos, if I may, I want to just tell you how special this blanket is. This blanket is, de is designed for Chief Joseph. Chief, this Chief Joseph blanket commemorates one of our area's greatest Les Bears leaders. The arrowhead pattern symbolizes his courage as he led his tribe away from the U.S. cavalry, traveling more than 1,400 miles in severe conditions for three months. There, during the Nez Perce War of 1877, Chief Joseph was quoted as saying, I'm tired of fighting. It is cold and we have no blankets. My heart is sick and sad. Here's the best part. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever.
So you look like royalty in the blanket, presented to you by our own Stephen Davis. This is a moment that we'll never forget. Edith, thank you for no, coming course, this evening you. and for giving the students your time, answering the questions so beautifully. Of Stephen, thank you for the presentation. Thank of you course. guys. Have a good evening. See the faces here. Now. So I know which one is spy or not. You know? So. Come down and say. Want to invite all the students down for a group picture?